a pleasure to welcome you, whether you are with us live in uh, the venue here or whether you are listening online or in our classic service or maybe in our Moon campus. It is so very good to be together. I'm glad to be back with you. I was gone last weekend, and it's just good to be, good to be in God's presence with God's people and singing and worshiping and uh, just having this time together also to look into His Word. Before we get into the Word today, there's just a one <clears throat> quick announcement that I want to make or a little bit of an update for you. You know that as we were coming through December, we were striving to eliminate some some amount that we were behind on our budget, and uh, I don't have all of the absolute final numbers for you yet. We'll share all of that with you next weekend, but I do want to tell you that some really encouraging things have happened. And uh, I'm so very excited about that, and you will be too. And I just want you to uh, anticipate that. Next week, we'll have all of those numbers that we can share with you. But just wanted to give you a little bit of an update, because I know that many of you have been praying, and you've been giving, and uh, so uh, good things in store there. So let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, it is good to be here. It's good to be in your presence. We thank you for your faithfulness and the faithfulness of your people. And we pray that in these moments now that you would lead us, that you'd open our minds and our hearts to what it is that you would share with us through the scriptures that we are going to look at together. And we pray that we'd be drawn closer to one another and closer to you as a result. And we ask for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. A few months ago, our family was all together, and we were thinking about different things that we might go and try and, and do. And I said to Carolyn on one occasion when we were kind of alone, I said, what we ought to do is we should go axe throwing. Now, I haven't really known my wife to be much of an axe wielder in our marriage. I haven't seen her wield an axe much or ever. And so I was a little bit surprised when she said, yeah, that would be fun. And I said, really? And she said, absolutely. And so we did. And I've even got proof. If you just look at the screens, you can, you can see. Oh, right. To right there. And she goes for it. <laughs> she went after it. She nailed it. That was awesome. It was fantastic. Now, before they actually put axes into our hands at this place, there were two things that happened. One of them was that they made us sign a waiver a waiver that said that we wouldn't sue them if anybody in our group was maimed or killed. You know, that was the first thing we had to do. The second thing was that the instructor stepped into the cage before we ever were allowed to go in the cage, or certainly given an ax, and he said, this is what I need you to do. I need you to follow after the directions that I'm going to give you. I need you to follow me in the way that you hold the ax and the way that you throw it and, and how you step and where and all of these sorts of things. He says, you do that, you're going to have success. And I was glad he did that because... There were a couple in our group who were a little bit uncertain whether or not they were going to be able to have any success at doing this, but he said, I guarantee your success if you just follow after me. And so he showed us all the things that he had to show us, and, and uh, then we stepped in, and people had success. And actually, it was, alar it was alarming to see how good the women in my family were at throwing axes. And nobody was maimed in the whole process either. But the instructor stepped in, he said, follow me, do this, and you'll have success. Today, we're going to take a look at a different instructor, but he says the same thing. He says, follow after me, and you're going to have success. And the circumstance where we find this is all found for us in the Gospel of Matthew and in chapter 9. And I invite you to grab a Bible, open up. If you're not in the habit of bringing a Bible, this is a great year to get in that habit because every week we're in a passage of Scripture. Every week we're going to be in a passage of Scripture. And it'd be good for you just to be able to open it up and see it right there. And I'd encourage you to do that now. In fact, maybe we can get a little bit more house light so that people are, are a little bit more able to see. Uh, there we go. Now that might be a little bit easier for you to, to read. All right, so Matthew chapter 9 is where we're going to be. And what the instructor here is going to tell us, and what is central to what this whole message is about, is this idea. He says, follow me. Follow me, and you will experience some success. Matthew 9 is where we find this. Now, this is a great place to begin this new sermon series that we're kicking off today that we're calling In Focus. In Focus, because the truth is, there are a lot of things that have gotten pretty blurry in our world. 
Have you noticed this? Lines of gender have gotten a bit blurry as of late. Or standards of, of sexuality and morality have gotten blurry in our world. Or concepts of what spirituality is is a bit blurry. Or the concept of what truth even is is blurry in our world today. Or biblical doctrine. Out of personal convenience, people are blurring the lines on that. And perhaps what they once believed very staunchly, now out of personal convenience, they're, they're blurring those lines. Or what it means to find a path where you can engage with people who might not feel the same way that you do on this issue or on that issue. The path to finding a way forward together with them has gotten pretty blurry in the world in which we live today, and you've experienced that, but this is the world that we live in, and it's the context in which we are all called to engage. So the question that we need to deal with is, what does that require of us? If this is the world that we live in, if we're being called to engage in that world, what does it mean to, to get all of that in focus? Because it can be pretty challenging in our minds as we look around us, as we see the division, as we see all of what's going on, to understand how do we bring this in focus in terms of what our responsibility is in this world in which we live? And we're going to be thinking about that. That's what this whole series is going to be about for the next three or four weeks. Being in focus, seeing our mission clearly is what we are going to be calling this. Now, someone who can help us get started on this journey is a guy named Matthew. Matthew is a guy who is just sitting, doing his business, I mean literally doing his business, I mean his work, and uh, he was just carrying that out the way that he was supposed to be doing it, kind of minding his own business. And Jesus walks up, and he makes kind of this big ask of him. And we see it here in its context in Matthew chapter 9. And in verse 9, if you look at that, it says this, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. Now, this is interesting because Matthew, who is being talked about here in this story, is the same guy who's writing the story. This is an autobiographical account that he is writing about this really amazing encounter that he has had with Jesus. And the first detail that he gives us about himself is that he's a tax collector. Now, do you think tax collectors were loved or despised in the first century? Despised. So, not much has changed. <laughs> right? Yeah, but regardless of how much you might hate the IRS or how much you might hate other things like pop-up ads or how that last french fry in the box always seems to fall between the car seat and the center console, you know what I'm talking about? So frustrating with that. As much as you hate all of us, that's nothing to come and compare to the way that they felt about first century tax collectors. You see, he's a Jewish guy who's collecting Roman taxes from Jewish people, and he's lining his own pockets by overcharging them at their expense, and they hated him. Absolutely hated him. Now, here's the context of what's going on that you need to also understand. See, Jesus also has a group of other people who are following him by this point. A group of other people who are following him. So other disciples, people like Peter and Andrew that he's already called to come and follow. And now here, they hear Jesus invite Matthew to come and follow and to join their team. They would have not been okay with this. This is not something that they would have wanted at all. Did you catch the Steelers game this last Monday? Especially toward the end of the game or see some of the recap of what happened there at the end of the I I got to tell you, I thought it was pretty sweet how, they, how the Steelers fans just sort of loved on Ben Roethlisberger there at the end. Of course, because everybody believes that he's played his last game or that was his last game at Heinz Field. And they just sort of poured out their hearts in a way. And I thought it was really pretty cool. Of course, what that means is that we're going to now need a new quarterback, right? Now imagine that after the game that you had heard Mike Tomlin go up to Baker Mayfield the quarterback of the Browns, who they beat, ironically, at the last game, which is pretty cool, to go up to him and invite him to be the quarterback going forward. You'd probably be like, no! Right? Because you wouldn't want Well, that's exactly what the disciples are thinking here. They're like, you're inviting Matthew to join our team? No! That's not what we want. He doesn't belong. You know who he is? We all hate him. Everybody hates him. He should not be on our 
team, but he's invited to join. Look what happens. Verse 9 again, it says, follow me, is what Jesus said to Matthew, and Matthew got up and followed him. In a moment, and apparently without any hesitation, Matthew leaves his lucrative business to give it all up to go live in relative poverty following Jesus. It's like, really? Did that really happen? Yeah, that really happened. Friends, don't dismiss the idea that God might call you to go and do something that might not seem completely logical on the surface. But as we enter in, as Matthew enters in, we come to find that this is far more fulfilling. This is far more meaningful than me just continuing to line my pockets with this money that really doesn't belong to me. So that's what Matthew does. Don't dismiss what God calls you to do, even if it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense in the moment. Now, we need to understand that this invitation to follow is about more than just trailing along behind Jesus and see what he does. What Matthew's being invited into here is the inner circle Jesus' inner circle with Peter and with Andrew and James and John and all the others. That's what he's being called to do. And at this point, the religious leaders are thinking, or the religious people are thinking, Jesus, it can't be that easy. You just call him and he's now in? It's that e- it can't be that easy. It's like, Jesus, what you really mean is that he can come and hang around a little bit, and if he proves himself to be able to clean up his life, then proves himself to be faithful for several months, then maybe we'll invite him to get into the discipleship program. And if he passes the discipleship program, then maybe we'll consider him for inclusion. Jesus says, no. It is that easy. I'm inviting him in, now, in the moment. The decision to follow Jesus for the first time or in a renewed way, something we need to understand, can be made in a moment. In In fact, the decision is always made in a moment. It's always made in a heartbeat. Yes, sometimes there's more buildup for one person than there is for another, but every one of us made a decision, if you have already made the decision to follow Jesus, that I'm going to do it in a moment. That's what he does here also. You might say, but I don't know all of the Bible. Neither did Matthew. But I've still got some questions So did Matthew. But he knew that God was calling him to sign up and to follow now. And the rest fell into place as he went along. There's no excuse for us to say, you know what, maybe once I'm in a little bit longer, maybe once I feel the call for several weeks in a row, I'll go ahead. No, sometimes we get to the place where we've been feeling the call and we've been pushing it off and we've been pushing it off and now we don't feel the call anymore because it's passed us by. And we miss the opportunity because we didn't respond when Jesus said, follow me. Matthew does. Good for him. So what's he do next? Verse 10. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. (laughs) If you think the guys had a problem with Matthew just hanging around, how do you think they feel about going over to his house and having wings? Yeah. Yeah. This, this is not something where they're real comfortable in being. I can, assure you of, I can assure you of that. And it's not just Matthew. It's all of his tax collector buddies are there too. And all of these unsavory characters, questionable characters. Think about that for yourself. Now, not in that specific context because we don't live in that context, but in your own context. What's the, what, what, what would be a group that you would be the least comfortable being around? Just whatever that might, drug dealers, prostitutes, Democrats, Republicans, cat owners. I mean, who would it be that you'd be least comfortable being around? Now imagine sitting down and having fellowship with them and eating dinner with them. That's what they're doing. It's definitely something that took the disciples out of their comfort zone, but not Jesus. Jesus was comfortable being around sinners. He was never one to say, you know what, I'm going to keep my distance so that they don't influence me. He's saying, I'm going to get as close as I can so I can influence them. Very different perspective. And one where he ends up having that influence. If you want to live in focus with God's call in your life, you've got to learn this lesson. We all need to learn this lesson. Look, we're all very familiar with COVID. i I know that that's true. We're all super, but did you know that there's another pandemic that has been swirling around us these last couple years as well? 
It's actually been around longer than that, but it's really reared its head over these last couple of years. And that pandemic is polarization. Polarization, it's real. It's that there are gaps that exist between people and groups, and more than ever before, those people and groups have become entrenched in their own view, and they're choosing to just hang out right there. And so they're surrounding themselves with other people who think just the way that they do, and little by little, they're purging other people from their lives who think differently than they do. Until all of a sudden, they find themselves surrounded only by people who have the same view, the same belief, the same actions as they do. It's happening all around us, and we all feel that pull because it's more comfortable to live there. And the reason it's more comfortable to live there is because everybody thinks the same way. And so we feel very able to to speak boldly and confidently and loudly about the things that we believe because we're speaking to people. We're speaking to the choir. We're speaking to people who are in our own tribe. And you have people on this side who do that and people on this side who do it for themselves. And there's more polarization than ever. And people are not coming together, which means that the influence that one might have on the other is not happening. And to just launch some grenade from your camp into the other camp is not changing anybody's mind. They're just causing additional angst and additional separation. And so the polarization is growing more and more and more. And for some people, that's preferable. You can see the mindset when Jesus heads over to Matthew's house. Jesus just waltzes right in. The disciples, they're not quite as sure. They're not quite as ready to walk in. And the religious people see that. And so they approach them. Verse 11, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? The Pharisees had this perspective that you should just be with your kind of people. Cut everybody else off. Separate yourself from anyone else because you don't want to live with them. You don't want to be influenced by them. Yes, you can talk about them. You can even talk at them. Just don't talk to them. That's what a lot of people do. That's how a lot of Christians behave today as well. We haven't been called to separate ourselves so that we would not have any engagement with people who are on the outside, who are apart from Christ. We've been called to engage. Yes, it's more comfortable to live there because everybody's like us. It's more comfortable and less influential. Jesus says, that's not me. Jesus is like, I'm not about finding a life of ease. I'm about finding a life that's effective and making a difference. And that's what he's calling us to. And if we want to see life in focus, we need to recognize to what it is that we've been called and not be willing to just sort of live a life of isolation that is comfortable and easy for us, but rather to fulfill what God has called us to when he called us to follow him as well. Pharisees are not of that mindset. Verse 12, on hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. That would have ticked them off completely, in part because they didn't think they had anything to learn, and in part because Jesus is using what they claimed as their own scriptures against them. He's quoting from Hosea. Chapter 6, verse 6, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So, what's that mean? What it means is that Jesus... His saying he didn't come to gather a group of like-minded people to sit behind closed doors and do Bible study. So, Pastor Jeff, you're saying that it's wrong to do Bible? No, 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 don't go there. I'm not saying it's wrong to do Bible study. We should do Bible study. In fact, I'd encourage you, if you're not engaged in Bible study, that this is the moment that you would get engaged that you'd use the beginning of this year to jump off into a small group or jump into a Bible study or get connected so that you can learn, so that you can grow with people who share your faith. Absolutely do that. But what I am saying is that you cannot become spiritually mature behind those closed doors. That's where it's different from what we've often believed. If I can just fill myself up enough, if I can just study enough, I'm going to become spiritually mature. No, you can't. Because it requires doing something with the things that you might learn behind those doors in order to demonstrate that spiritual maturity. Jesus spent time together with the disciples, sure, behind closed doors. Yes, he taught them. He trained them. To do what? To go out. To engage with other people. 
to engage with sinners, to engage with the world so that the gospel of Christ might go forward as well. That's what he's training them to do. Jesus said he didn't come to call the righteous alone, but to call the sinners. Jesus also said he desires mercy, not sacrifice. Now, when he says, I don't desire sacrifice, he's not saying that I don't desire that you would go outside yourself, beyond yourself, that you would give fully of your... He's not saying... That's not what he means by sacrifice. He's talking about the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. He's saying, I don't want you to just live by rules and rituals, what it used to be. I desire that you would demonstrate mercy. That's the thing that he is saying has been missing. What is missing is looking at the people and needs and issues all around us and engaging with them so that we might be able to have a relationship with them. What is missing is looking at the sinner and having a burden for them because we genuinely love them and desire to see them overcome their sin rather than sitting back and saying, I'm sure glad that they're going to get what's coming to them one day. What is missing is a willingness to step out of one's comfort zone and engage with a person that doesn't believe so that they might come to believe. That's our call. Jesus knew that his place of greatest influence was among the spiritually sick. And so that's where he went. And he's inviting Matthew to follow him so that he might go there also. And he invites us to follow him so that we might go there also. So that the pinnacle of the demonstration that we're following after Christ is not that we've isolated ourselves from all influences that might not be according to the way of Christ, but so that we might get out there for the sake of those who are in need. When Jesus says, follow me, he's saying, do what I do. Engage with those in need, those on the outside. And when you do, you're going to be demonstrating Christ-like behavior and people are going to notice. Believe me when I tell you that people have already made a decision about who you are. If you've said, I'm a Christ follower. They've already made a decision about who you are, what you believe, how you're going to respond to them because of what they believe or the life that they live. They've already settled that in their mind and they maybe haven't even met you. Or they know very, very little about you. What you have the opportunity to do is to break down that caricature that they have created about you. To turn it in a different direction. And when you do, you'll break down walls, you'll destroy presumptions, you'll open up channels of communication. It's not the easiest path, but it is the most God-honoring, and it's the most gospel-advancing And it's getting life in focus. Because that's what God wants for us. He wants us to see the mission clearly. And the mission is not to isolate. The mission is to engage for the sake of Christ and for the sake of those who are on the outside. For the sake of bridging the gap that exists between those who are living polarized lives today. We're the ones who are called to swim in the middle, to engage in that middle ground, to bridge the gap. This is such an important message that Jesus would come back to it over and over again. We see it a few chapters later, chapter 16 of Matthew, if you want to flip over there quick. He said this in verse 24, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and what? Follow me. me. And follow me. Same thing. He's saying here, a lot of times we read that that verse and our attention goes to our cross. Take up your cross. We get fascinated with the idea of of what our cross is. We try to figure that out. We make that verse all about figuring out what our cross is. It's not that difficult. Your cross is just what God's call is on your life. You just take up God's call and you live it out. But when we focus so heavily on our attention going to what's our cross, we tend to miss what the central part of this verse really is all about. The deeper significance that is here. Jesus' point is that you can live for yourself or you can follow him. That's his point. It's one way or the other. Now, we're people who are very good at trying to create a third way, a third option, which is to say, well, as long as I confess Christ... I can kind of show that I'm in with him a good bit, a good bit, but I can also live for myself a good bit. 
And so we create this third way. And you can do that if you want. And many people have. Maybe you have. Jesus is just saying, just don't call yourself my disciple. You're like, what? Of course I'm his. He said, no. You say, how do you know that? Because we just read it. Look at it again, verse 24. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. He goes on in verse 25. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Sounds kind of like a riddle. Because I was going to say knives. I met a man with seven. Right? That's not this. This is not a riddle. Whoever wants to save their life by their own effort, by their own wisdom, by their own will, is going to lose it. It says on the flip side, whoever loses their life for Christ, whoever makes the choice to invest their life for his sake, will gain it. Will gain what? Value, meaning, purpose, influence, opportunity. All of the things that God calls us to follow him for. That's what it'll do. Jesus summed it up by saying, verse 26, What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? And what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. I think it matters to Jesus how you live. You better believe that it does, according to this. He says he's watching. He says your choice has eternal consequences. He's bringing this into focus for us so that we don't miss the point. Now, where does that leave you today? What is it that you're willing to deny in order to follow Jesus? You're like, well, we don't talk in terms of denying. I mean, come on, this is 2022. We don't deny ourselves anything. We just go for what we want. That's what the world does. No. He says, if you want to be my disciple, you'll deny yourself. What is it that you need to deny yourself? What is the call that Jesus might have on our lives? Are you willing to deny some ease in order to engage with somebody else outside of your comfort zone? Someone who has a lifestyle that's very different from yours? Are you willing to sacrifice your convenience so that you might engage in a relationship with somebody else across a line that previously you don't know that you'd ever be willing to cross? you willing to deny some of your resource in order to gladly follow after the call that God has for your life? I think about all Matthew had from a worldly point of view. He had the world by the tail, by his occupation, by the way that he was lining his pockets. He said, yeah, I can be done with that for you, Jesus. Wow. A lot of times I'm not sure I'm willing to go there. Maybe you're not willing to go there either. Jesus said, follow me. Matthew says, okay. It can really be that straightforward. Now you might say, well, I'm not so sure it's so easy for me. Because I tried that. In fact, I've been there. In fact, I've done that. And it went well for a while, and then not so well for a while. And I started slipping from that priority, and before I knew it, I had kind of slipped back into old lifestyle, or or I'd allow other priorities to sort of crash in and start to take over for me. And I'm not even so sure that Jesus would have an interest in having me back, or maybe it's kind of late for me to be that person. I understand what you're saying. In fact, if that's what you're thinking or saying, you're sounding a lot like the Apostle Peter. See, before Jesus ever went and said to Matthew, follow me, he went to Peter and he said, follow me. Peter said, okay. And he did, and he gave himself 110% to following after Jesus. Left his fishing business. Went and did everything that Jesus had asked him to do, boldly, brashly. Until Jesus was nearing the cross. He said to Peter, you're going to deny me. Peter said, no way said, you are. In fact, you'll do it three times. And he did. And when Peter recognized and realized what it was that he had done, he was despondent with grief and regret and remorse. Then something amazing happened. Jesus rose from the dead. 
Peter heard that the tomb was empty, and he went and he ran and he saw it for himself. Then Jesus appeared to him and some other disciples. He got to see him alive. Then sometime later after that, he's out fishing in the boat while Jesus is still on earth before he ascends into heaven, and he's out fishing with some of his buddies, and, and they're, they've been skunked all night long, haven't caught a thing. And somebody calls from the shore, cast your net onto the other side. And they do. They thought, why would we? <laughs> There's no fish here. But they did. And you know the story. There were so many fish in the net that they couldn't even pull it up into the boat. And one of the disciples said to Peter, it must be the Lord. And Peter replied, thank you, Captain Obvious. <laughs> And Peter jumped out of the boat and he swam to the shore because he couldn't wait for the boat to get there itself because he wanted to get to Jesus. And he did, and Jesus was there and he was preparing breakfast for them. He was frying them some fish, which has always sounded disgusting to me, fish for breakfast. But if Jesus ever chooses to serve me breakfast and fish is on the menu, I'm eating fish. That's all I got to say. And that's what Peter said too. But then Jesus gets serious with Peter. He says, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes, I love you. But then Jesus asked him again and asked him a third time, do you love me? Peter says, yes, I love you. But he's getting troubled in his spirit because Jesus keeps asking. And I have to believe he's wondering, does Jesus believe me? Is my relationship ever going to be strong with Jesus again because I failed him so horribly? Then Jesus comes around. Do you know what he says to Peter? He says, follow me. He gives him the invitation yet again to follow. See, Peter hadn't lost his opportunity to follow after Christ. It didn't matter what he had done. Jesus invites him, in, and he does. In fact, he writes a couple letters that we now have in the New Testament. That's how much he was able to do even after he had failed so completely. And the fact is that that's exactly how Jesus approaches you. Regardless of what you've done, regardless of how you've failed, regardless of how perhaps 2021 was a year of not walking very well with Jesus, he comes to you today and he says, follow me. And in a moment, in a decision, you can say, I'm going to follow. I'm going to follow after you. In fact, I'm going to run after you. Maybe you've been in a situation where you've been walking away. Maybe you've never really chosen to engage. So maybe this would be like a first time experience for you to say, yes, to Jesus calling you to follow him. Either way you can. Maybe you came today and you're, maybe you're here because of somebody else sort of pushed you to, to be here. And, or maybe you're here out of a little bit of guilt. Or maybe it's a new year and you're like, you know, I think I should maybe try connecting a little bit more than what I have in the past. And so your heart might not even have really been in it, but in these moments you've heard God's Spirit prompting and speaking to you and saying, this is what I'm inviting you into. This is what I'm calling you to do and where I'm calling you to follow. Speaking specifically to you, wondering if you'll say, yes, I will follow. You might say, well, I don't have all the answers. Neither did Matthew. There's still some questions on my mind. I don't know everything I should know about the Bible. Neither did Matthew. He jumped in and it proved that that's exactly where he should be. And all the rest fell into place. Now for you today, that might require a tweak in your life. It might require a partial life change. For you, it might be whole scale. You have to turn things over from the very bottom of your life to the top. But your response can be as simple as Matthew's. Yes, I'll do it. I'll follow. Following Jesus means doing what he did, engaging with other people 
who didn't believe, engaging with sinners, engaging with people whose lifestyle was very different than the one that he came to live or to promote. And so part of what it means for us to follow would be to follow in those steps and I would encourage you and challenge you in, the, in these four weeks that we're going to be in this series that, that along the way in them, at least once, hopefully more than that, at least once you will reach out and invite somebody else into a conversation, out to coffee, over for dinner, engaged in a relationship, something, a way to step across that line towards somebody that you know is very much on, a, on the other side of the fence, and engage in a relationship, and just get it started there, talking, listening, understanding, because it's only out of that that we're going to be able to even earn a right to be heard. That's what Jesus does. He shows up at Matthew's house with tax collectors and sinners, questionable characters, so that he might be able to engage so that he might be able to fulfill God's call on his life. Part of following Jesus, of saying yes, is living how he lived. Part of following or saying yes to follow me is to do what Matthew does also. Matthew makes the choice that regardless of all of these other things, these reasons why I might not engage, I'm going to. And he does. He becomes the most meaningful part of his life. In fact, it defines his life going forward, and it will yours also. Jesus says, follow me. Will you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that the call that is on Matthew is the same call that's on all the rest of us. You're calling us all to follow you, to follow the model and do what Jesus did. Lord, we don't have any right to complain about what's going on on a different side of a fence from what we might choose to live our life if we're not willing to engage across that fence. Lord, we are the people as followers of Jesus Christ who have the call to march in no man's land, the, the space in between. And I pray that we'd be willing to do so. There's only one thing that can break down the barriers that exist, and that is the movement of God. There have been plenty of peace treaties and things that have been trying to bring people together, and ultimately it, it, it fails, because what has to happen is a change of heart, and we're the ones who know the one who can change hearts. And so the onus is on us. It's not, we all need to be willing to meet half, no, we don't. Jesus has called us to go the whole way. So I pray we'd be courageous enough to take that step with someone, maybe many someones, in these weeks that are ahead, as a way to respond to following after you. And maybe for us, it's here in this moment, your spirit is speaking to us and he's calling us to follow. Lord, I pray that we would be able to take on Matthew's mindset and instead of thinking all of all of the excuses for why I shouldn't or why I can't or what also needs to happen to set all of that aside, and say, I know you're calling me. My answer is yes. If you're, if you're listening today, wherever you are, and, and you recognize what that means for you is that you need to say your very first yes to Jesus. You need to commit your life to him. You can do so just by praying to your God. I confess you to be Lord, I recognize that for the first time. I don't understand it all, but I know you're calling, and I'm saying yes. Come be my Lord, be my Savior. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. 
Thank you for your desire to draw people to yourself. Thank you for your love for all people. Lord, I pray that we would move forward, not seeing this side versus that side, but seeing everyone as those whom you love and those for whom you died and treating them accordingly. Lord, we need to get these things in focus because there's so many things that would lead us in a different direction. We need to get these in focus. We need to see the mission clearly. And it's starting to break through the fog to understand that even in this moment. And I pray that we would and that we'd follow boldly after you. Thank you for your call. Follow me. Or today we want to say yes. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for connecting with us here today at Pathway Online. I hope you've enjoyed yourself and that God has shown you something new. We look forward to connecting with you once again next week, either here online or in person at one of our venues. God bless you and your family.